Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to talk about Bell Hooks' Eating the Other, Desire and Resistance, which is a super interesting text. I'm looking forward to uh, digging into it here. But before then, if you want to follow me other than on YouTube here, uh, you can follow me at Instagram, on Instagram, at theory underscore and underscore philosophy to see mostly pictures of my cats. If you haven't already, uh, follow me here. If you're new here, hi, I'm David. I try to explain philosophical and theoretical texts in a somewhat accessible way as best as I can. Uh, so if you, you know, like what I do, hit subscribe and you'll see my videos every every single week and that, that would be great. Uh, if you want to help me out for those that, uh, you know, are already here, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends, who knows, they might get a kick of it. If you're listening to this in podcast form, the video is on YouTube. And if you're listening to this on YouTube or watching it on YouTube, you will, you will be able to find it in podcast form where there shouldn't be any ads. And yeah, good. Is that good? It's probably good. Uh, let's jump into this here. So this is a pretty important essay um, that Be- Bell Hooks wrote, and it's it's quite good. And for those that haven't read it, I definitely recommend that you do. Um, but it is tricky, and I hope that maybe I can try and make it a little bit easier. I hope, at least. I'm not going to claim that I can do such a thing so easily, but I'll but I'll try. So what Hooks is doing here is describing the way that non-white cultures are often commodified. Uh, And that, of course, we're seeing this kind of, uh, we saw this develop with various marketing strategies uh, in the mid to late 20th century up up till now. But we're also seeing it playing out in, in other ways and how, for instance, how tourism is growing into such a big industry, uh, especially with uh, tourism from the North America to places like Thailand or Vietnam or, or something like that. But of course, it, it would be totally naive to say that no one from those countries visits uh, like North America, for example. It's just about recognizing that there is a difference, at least in part, when we start to consider the ways that certain populations are framed within the dominant narrative and then how those cultures are appropriated. And it comes down to, at least in the final lines of the essay, Hooks really asks that question or motivates us to begin questioning how do we discern the difference? Because this isn't just a, uh, you know, simple act acting upon non-white bodies by white people. That would be way too uh, reductive just it just doesn't um, encapsulate the complexities of something like representation of something like tourism or um, you know the use of elements from other cultures be it their food or their dress or I- their language it's a very difficult topic no one's gonna deny that but this is a really good essay to help us to consider how it can go from what Hooks calls cultural appreciation to cultural appropriation, and how do we how do we negotiate that is really one of the one of the central points of this text. So, in the commodification of another culture, what we see is that culture essentially being taken out of its context and then made into something that is consumable. Now, this relates this use of the the term commodity relates, of course, to Marxism and Marxist thought, where for Marx. The idea is that uh, a commodity becomes a commodity when it is detached from any association with its history, that is, within production, and it just seems like an object that exists on its own, as though it has a kind of magical value or a value that comes as though from nowhere, not from its history within production. And I've done a whole uh, episode on commodity fetishism. If anyone's interested in that, you can go and check that out. But that's kind of setting the stage here. But this kind of fascination with non-white culture is different, or it marks a shift in how traditionally, or in the past 50, 60, 70 years, and even further back in the North American context, other cultures were really shunned. And of course, the history of racism in, in the United States is testament to that, in that there wasn't an obsession with otherness, there was just a complete repudiation, a complete foreclosure of otherness, unless it was meant for like labor purposes. 
be they, you know, um, f from the slave trade or from, uh, you know, Chinese laborers who, who did really uh, wonderful things in terms of building the country that, that is now the United States, even though it was done through very harsh means. So this shift marks a kind of cosmopolitanism or a kind of multiculturalism that sees the other not as something to fear, but as something that can be appropriated. So the obsession then that she traces is not with the Barbie doll, like blonde haired woman with a, with a certain like uh, certain physical features that abide by um, a, a, a normalized body type, but instead there's a growing fascination with the other as a sexual object or something that can be used sexually. And she very, it's a very complicated idea that she develops here in that she sees that as, as a transformation from this old form of like racist um, repudiation and um, denial of the other to a new form of racism that sees the other as a play toy almost as a point of f fascination and experimentation on the part of like white bro dudes. So she provides an anecdote where she's walking on the sidewalk and there are these three uh, young men in front of her, young, young men, university students. She figured, because she was, I believe, she was in a university town and these are young men near the university. So she just put the, connected the dots who were talking about how they wanted to sleep with as many women of color as possible and that different women of color had different like rankage, rankage, different points, de depending on like how rare they were, as though they were like Pokemon or something like that, that could just be used to denote one of these men's like sexual prowess, as though their bodies are markers for uh, their sexual accomplishments. Now, Hooks then really dives into this and she's like the other in this case these these women of color are associated with a kind of exoticism and they're associated with a kind of difference that is other than the kind of self-ordering uh, sameness of the lives of these men where they live a, you know probably a pretty uh, standard came from uh, probably some white picket fence background and they're seeking that experience and so they locate that experience with or among these women of color that they can then use for their own development, their own change, as though it's just a rite of passage for them. But to them, probably, they see themselves as being non-racist. I mean, they want to have these couplings with people that aren't of their same race, so that must mean that they're not racist. But Hooks is very suspicious of this and sees it rather as um, just as I've kind of already alluded to, as the emergence of this kind of new racist trend, this neo-racism that sees the other as an object for the satisfaction of these men. Interestingly then, Hook says that this is marks a kind of animosity or a sort of regret about an imperialist past where the real goal of imperialism was to purge the world of difference, right? The imperialists saw it, and you know, you different imperialists from different countries, of course, but the history of imperialism is, is pretty strongly a European one. But they saw it to rid the world of difference in order to make it like Christian, to make it democratic, to make it what, not, not democratic, but to make it like um, essentially European or to, to spread that word about civilization to so-called uncivilized people. And it seems as though this would be a reversal of that. That is, there's a kind of, that these men would almost be happy about the fact that that project was not acted out because then they wouldn't have had these uh, women, in this case, to objectify as being different because they would have all been subsumed under the same kind of European category through the acts of, or through the process of colonization or the the process is a pretty banal way to put it, the horrors of colonization. And so these differences that we see play out here with this fascination with the other seek to kind of reinsert an idea of racial difference that seek to kind of operate and to make it kind of an example of identity politics that is these men 
who probably would be would be opposed to anything related to identity politics are playing that out in that they are associating these women uh, these women of color with a certain exotic identity not based on their character but based purely on their race and this is just one example of the ways the many ways in which identity politics plays out in many racist spheres but that it is only called out when it's like feminists calling attention to racism being enacted upon certain bodies because then it's like oh you're just calling attention to race you're not actually paying attention to people's uh, characteristics you're just drawing upon systemic things that don't actually have to do with people's day-to-day -day lives yada 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 but we're seeing that play out very much in this sphere as well and so there's a kind of freezing of the other in their difference as being different and it kind of in this act of consuming the other in this way of eating the other it's almost as though these these white men are trying to become the other like they're trying to get themselves out of their really you know banal existence into new possibility and how many uh young men do this like rite of passage traveling experience after high school to like find themselves and they'll go to thailand or they'll go to uh, south america or something to you know experience the world that always just ends up with them returning home for the for the vast majority of these people where they just treated the other as uh, a stage to go through not as something to be necessarily respected or or um, to be worked with but something that is to be consumed for these people's own benefit now in order for this any kind of interaction between white people and non-white people to be acted out and we can see this happening in many other different spheres and it would be totally wrong to say that this is like exclusively a white phenomenon we see this happening in in like india for example where there is this kind of appreciation of lighter skinned people over darker skinned people or in other asian countries in which there seems to be or there is very much um uh a disdain for people who have darker skin tones versus lighter ones or just a general appreciation of lighter skin tones and see we see this playing out over and over and over again and as just an aside like m many of our cultural um, kind of artifacts or kind of cultural uh, representations place a strong emphasis on whiteness and lightness as being associated with good and this goes you know f from religion all the way to Mr. Clean ads, we see this constant illustration of whiteness being good and lightness being associated with good and darkness being associated with bad and how certain places of the earth like Africa is the dark continent, that kind of unknown, unclear thing, kind of still um, shrouded in tradition, shrouded in um, archaic, ideals that don't actually do much for the people themselves but is instead just something they're they're just stuck with which isn't it's absolutely not true at all but these images constantly reemerge to instill the idea that there is a kind of uh, exceptionalism associated with lighter skinned people and the common thread that we see and this is really all across the globe in this appreciation of lighter skinned people is that the more white you are the easier it is for you not only to move around in your own setting you feel comfortable with but across the globe as well so this is a kind of to be quite uh, dramatic about it it's like a certain kind of imperialism that plays out like over and over and over again and that is constantly reinforced and this gets even more reinforced when we consider like language politics and how it is so much easier for english speaking people to move throughout the earth and how it is expected, how English people expect that everyone around them is going to speak English and how it would be totally absurd if someone who was uh, Vietnamese walked into uh, a cafe in Nebraska and started to ask for food in Vietnamese, people would be completely confounded. They wouldn't know what to do. Whereas there's so many examples that we see of like um, television shows where people go and eat in like these rural communities in some Asian country just asking for things in English and just talking in English. There are no shows like that of people from 
Vietnam coming to America doing like these things about oh these hamburgers uh, how great they are let us let us eat them and, and speak to everyone in Vietnamese people would be absolutely offended and would uh, like demand that they speak English or at least have a very good interpreter there but in any case I'm rambling but in this easy capacity to move around uh, it is possible then for white people to be uh, you know they're moving around of their own volition it isn't they aren't like institutionalized or moved around in that way it is much easier for white people to assume a kind of cosmopolitan or um, kind of multicultural uh, appreciation that is they can welcome these things because nothing really affects them in the way that it might affect someone else that is there is a, a, a believed move away from tradition on the part of like Western people or people associated with the West uh, especially white people in these contexts that give them a certain privilege while other people are still caught in tradition now I'm not saying that that's the case but this is certainly one image that or one idea that is uh, kind of reinscribed in our day-to-day -day, in our day-to-day -day lives that is in many of the different media we consume many of the different images that we consume that constantly reinvigorate the idea that white people are like more developed moving away from tradition not stuck in the past whereas other people especially non-white people are, are still stuck to their traditions and they just need to develop and, and get out of that as though their race is not holding them back within a globalized white centric world it is very difficult for any culture to just just do what uh, those of European heritage can now come to comfortably do on the world stage. Now again, this is a, an extremely difficult uh, situation and it really should be handled in, in much more microscopic ways. And I'm not saying that Hooks needed to do that. Hooks is giving us a very interesting approach to this problem. But to really get at the heart of it, of course, there's much more nuance that's needed uh, in terms of what whiteness is, the history of whiteness, who is considered white, who is not considered white, white passing people, uh, people of, you know, people of color, how different people of color are uh, work alongside, cooperate with, are antagonistic with, just by uh, ver various histories with whiteness. It is extremely complicated um, and demands. A lot of work and this work has been done across many different books and many different writers uh, but this so this is just one piece of it and so to kind of wrap it up or to conclude books is very skeptical of any kind of reactive effort to reclaim a kind of cultural identity that is being uh, appropriated or consumed by the dominant uh, class or, or, or race. She gives the example of black nationalism that she says is more a gesture of powerlessness than it is one of critical resistance. And she says the same thing about rap music, and she's very critical of rap music, and in my mind, suspiciously critical of, of black male youth culture in the United States. But she, she says that it, it does more, it does less for the black community uh, than more meaningful action does in that it is in the case of rap music it is very uh, sexist um, misogynistic homophobic and so we aren't actually seeing effective challenges to the system at hand or to stuff like uh, things like essentialism that so often works against black bodies we actually see a reinscription of that she says with something like rap music that is more reactive than necessarily proactive which that there are different approaches to that question, uh, but in any case, that's what she gives us, and it's it's super interesting. And she concludes by really emphasizing again that we need to be having these conversations about the difference between cultural appreciation and appropriation. If you're just wearing um, Native American clothing to go to uh, a, a concert or to a Halloween party, you should probably be interrogating that if you're with uh, indigenous people who ask you to wear uh, traditional uh, of a traditional nation's uh, clothing then that's absolutely a wonderful thing that you've been welcomed into that community to be a be a part of that but of course the distinction is difficult to draw how do we identify what is like in the case of the united states what is black culture attire versus 
uh, white attire. And how do we actually develop these lines? Because they're, they're change, they change so rapidly as well that, it, that it's just difficult to necessarily know what to do. Dreadlocks are probably bad though. It's just one thing <laughs> for, for white people, but in any case, uh, that's that. If you'd like to tell me more about what you might think or anything you'd like to add, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, if you didn't like what I did here, there's the dislike button for that reason. And yeah, if you, if you, if you liked it, subscribe and then tune in next week. I'll have something else for you. And yeah, take care everyone.